Thanks. Take her down to periscope depth. Yes, sir. Clear the bridge. Dive. <laughs> Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova, and I'm privileged to be joined by Emery Moina, who is a graduate student of biology. And he and I, we consider ourselves graduate students in, in the sciences. And we're hosting this show. Uh, he's my co-host, and I'm the host. And we're, we're, we're uh, doing this show because we want to reach out to science students who are Christians and who lean toward intelligent design or who are even creationists uh, in the hopes of giving them kind of moral support that they're not alone. I certainly know what it's like to be in a classroom and maybe the only creationist in the classroom. Although, um, let me qualify that. Uh, in some of my classes at the NIH, I was surprised when uh, a classmate said, I don't believe in evolution and, and some of them openly question it. So the sympathies are there, and uh, there may be more of us than we know, but we keep our mouths shut uh, to, to just, just not make trouble. I mean, if someone asked me, do you believe in evolution, if the, the teacher just asked me and uh, wanted to humiliate me in front of the class, I, I would, I, I'd, I'd tell them what, what I believe. And, uh, but, but as far as... Uh, taking exams and doing homework. Uh, when I respond to a question on an exam, I'm articulating how knowledgeable I am of what the teacher taught, not that I agree. Um, even on things that are not related to the creation evolution controversy, I knew there were a few things the professor said that I didn't think were correct at all, but I gave the professor the answer that they were expecting, demonstrating at least I knew I was familiar with what they taught. And so uh, I had a class on cellular biology and I thought the professor said something that didn't agree with the textbook, something really basic like that. But um, I gave the answer I thought the professor was expecting. Um, same with another class on biochemistry. I'm familiar with statistical mechanics and thermodynamics and the professor said something that I didn't agree with. 
but I gave him the answer that he was expecting. So that will happen. But I just want to upfront say, you know, if, if I'm challenged and I'm at risk of being kicked out because of my beliefs, I'll stand up for my beliefs. But a, a response to a test question or a homework question doesn't represent necessarily, doesn't necessarily represent what I believe. Hmm. So oh, all that to say is for the Christians out there in Christians and creationists and ID proponents who are out there in secular uh, universities, colleges, graduate schools, and institutions, um, there are many of us who are in your situation. We're outnumbered, but we're here to, uh, we're having shows like this to support you. And then also we want to show the world that we really do take science seriously. We are Christians and we also, we're Christians and we're ID friendly. I'm a creationist, I'm a young earth creationist, but we also take science very seriously and we're willing to, we're willing to endure the uh, rigors of, uh, learning in an environment that is highly secular because that many of us believe that is where God has called us. But the treasures that God has hidden for us are in these places. And so uh, uh, again, and I've said this, the reason this channel exists is to find evidence and reasons for the Christian faith, evidence and reasons that God himself has hidden for us to discover so we look to learn about the hidden, the mostly hidden, not completely hidden, uh, Christian God who is invisible but is revealed through the things that are made. If God were as evident to our senses as the air we breathe, we wouldn't probably even be needing to have this channel. But it's the glory of God to conceal things. It's the glory of kings to search things out. And so this process of actually slugging it out, reading through current literature, both popular articles, which is, is a nice introduction to more technical things, and then actually the original technical articles is, uh, is a way we can uncover these treasures. The reason I say that is if even unbelievers, or let's say um, people who reject creation and ID, if some of the things that they say so obviously point to ID, um, that makes it more believable because uh, these are witnesses who would be considered hostile witnesses and even they grudgingly have to admit certain things. So with that, I really want to thank Emery for joining us. He's a little under the weather and I, I've been I salute worse. his determination to fight through illness, to be with me, uh, to be with us tonight. And uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here, Sally. It keeps me from uh, keeps me from getting into any mischief. Not that I could really get into a whole lot right now. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's all, I, I will never turn down the opportunity to talk science so long as I have the opportunity to use my voice. I will be more than happy to talk about science. So so long as I don't, you know, uh, you know, have strep or something like that, I'm, I'm gonna, not going to be turning these invitations down. So <laughs> that's great. So uh, to, to maybe save Emery's voice for tonight, and I have ulterior motives, while he's on semester break, I'm going to try to get as many evenings with him as I can. <laughs> and hopefully also in a way that will uh, uh, encourage him and maybe even uh, prepare him for his upcoming semester. So I, I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to meet uh, a, a like-minded Christian and creationist. And in the video description, there's going to be links to his website and YouTube channel. So um, uh, feel free to visit those. And uh, I'm again, I'm just thrilled to have uh, Emery join us. So let's get to it. There were, let's see if I could share my screen here. Emery mentioned that uh, one of his professors said that there's not really universal common ancestry in, in for eukaryotes. Uh, Emery, maybe you could have a few words about what your professor said. That sure, that sure. was really astonishing. Yeah. So, um, and it was, and she said it in a very offhand way too. It was like, oh, yeah, there's just no, we don't believe there's any common ancestry for eukaryotes anymore. And I went, what? 
Uh, I did the same thing Sal did. Um, with, I was like, wait, 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 what? You don't believe that anymore? Well, when did that happen? Why wasn't that in the textbook? Um, but at, at any rate, so it was a lot, it was actually the last lecture of the semester that for that particular class. Um, and I was sitting there watching the video, taking notes like I, like I always do. And we're going through, uh, Luca and uh, eukaryotic ancestry and so on. And I, I, you know, I was, and I had going through it and she, she was talking about eukaryotes and she was talking about, you know, we used to think that, that they had this, the single common ancestor, but you know, we, nobody, nobody in the field believes that anymore. And I went, you've got it. What? <laughs> what? You, what? And, and so I did a little bit of digging afterwards uh, because I mean that that just absolutely blew my mind. I, I don't usually take notes on exact words that the professor says. I usually just you know write down what they put down on the PowerPoint. But that is one of the few times that I've actually written down word for word what she said because I'm like, are you kidding? Um. So at any rate, I went back and looked, and turns out, uh, well, one of the art we're going to look at an article. This is a 2019 article, by the way. This this uh, article from Quanta that Sal's got up on the screen. So it's not like it's that old. Um, where they say, yeah, the universal common ancestor of eukaryotes, eh, maybe, maybe not. And, and, and the thing that um, amazed me is the problem is also appearing for eukaryotes. So uh, the policy that, um, the, the reason we're doing this is I want to try to just read the article in its entirety and say, so people actually hear it in context. Whatever my commentary is beyond that is my commentary. But, um, uh, and, and, and people can say, hey, Sal, you totally misinterpreted that. You're not representing it accurately. It's like, okay, the, the fair thing to do then is to say, okay, I'm just gonna read it. You'll see it in context. And, and then we'll just comment on it and say, those are my comments and my impressions. And that's, that's the fair thing. So. We also want to set an example for creationists who are studying this and to point out this is not, God does not make this easy to search a matter out. This God does make it a little bit hard uh, for people to find this. They have to go out there in the field and start digging up the treasure themselves that he hid away. And this is just the process. And so one reason it's, so um, comforting is when someone's out there in the field digging with you, it's not so lonely because uh, I could tell you that it's sometimes a little bit hard just spending hours kind of uh, in a virtual library, just reading article after article and it can get kind of tiresome. It's kind of nice to have some company on this uh, digging journey. So, um, so let's just uh, get right to this article. The article is, do you see it there on your screen, Emory? Yes, I do. Quantum Magazine. And I don't know, is there even an... Yeah. Researchers rethink the ancestry of complex cells. And this is in the section on evolution. New studies revise ideas about the symbiosis that gave mitochondria to cells and about whether the last common ancestor of all eukaryotes was one cell or many. Research into the origins of the complex cells called eukaryotes typically tries to trace lineages of organisms back to a single ancestral cell. But now scientists are considering whether that common ancestor might be an entire population of diverse cells. Our planet formed a little over 4.5 billion years ago. And if the most recent estimates are correct, it wasn't long before life arose. Not much is known about how that happened because it's maddeningly difficult to investigate. It's also proved tough to study what happened next during the first billion years of evolution that followed when the main domains of life emerged. I'm just gonna pause here. This is a popular article. This is not a peer reviewed article. It's a popular article uh, that references peer reviewed literature and also interviews some of the researchers. We will do a peer reviewed article if we have time. A particularly vexing mystery is the rise of the eukaryotes, cells within well-defined internal compartments or organelles, which are present only in animals, plants, fungi, and some microbes like proteasts, our evolutionary kin. 
the earliest eukaryotes left no clear fossils as clues. So researchers are forced to deduce what they were like by comparing the structural and molecular details of later ones and inferring their evolutionary relationships. So I want to pause you there and just throw a couple of quick in quick. Yes. So just as a quick, quick explanation for people, um, the earliest eukaryotes that they're talking about here, obviously I don't accept the timeline any bit of Sal, but let's just go, go with their timeline. What they're saying here essentially is that we know absolutely nothing about the original eukaryotes. We don't have fossils. We don't have gen their genome. We, know we have nothing. Everything we're figuring out is looking at existing eukaryotes and trying to infer backwards, build, basically building a phylogenetic tree in reverse, trying to go backwards to try and figure out what these things look like. Um, and, and just for those who don't know what a eukaryote is, a eukaryote is a cell that has membrane-bound organelles. Now, you don't know what those are either. Um, so what an organelle is, is basically just, it's a, it's a structure inside a cell that performs a, a particular function. It functions like an organ in the body. Um, so like the one that they're focusing on here is the mitochondria, which is what you would learn in high school biology is the powerhouse of the cell. It provides the ATP, the energy for the cell, but there are other ones as well. Um, so go ahead, so I just wanted to throw that in for anybody who wanted some clarity. Sal, go, Sal, go ahead. You're on the third paragraph. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was having some problems with Zoom. I couldn't okay. unmute my mic. <laughs> um, anyway, th thank you. And um, th this show is being pre-recorded for, for later. So um, maybe we could, um, I could clarify a few things in the chat if someone has right. questions. But I'm hoping that uh, and, and this is an invitation to other people that um, who have some technical background or who just really want to learn, they're more than welcome to, they're more than welcome to uh, uh, join the journal club because when the, when the new semester comes in, uh, uh, Emory won't have as much time. So, uh, so during the January, February, March, April timeframe, uh, if someone wants to join this journal club, that'd be great because otherwise it'll be monologues with me, which I'm willing to do. I'm quite determined to, to keep this journal club going. Anyway, right now is, quote, an incredibly exciting time for such research. Amen. Right now is an incredibly exciting time for such research, said Mich Michelle Ledger, a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Evolutionary Biology in Barcelona, Spain. With modern genetic sequencing technologies, scientists can read the entire genomes of diverse life forms. And as microbial life is revealed in ever increasing detail, new species and other taxonomic groups are coming to light. With that wealth of data, researchers are tracing lineages of organisms backward through time. We're trying to approach the problem from from so many sides, she said. That's pushing us closer to the first eukaryotes. And there's a picture of a paramecium, a single-celled protozoan microbe. It has a nucleus, mitochondria, and other organelles that are hallmarks of eukaryotic cells. Before I forget, because this is since it's showing a paramecium, this is a totally side topic, Emory. But when I was studying at, uh, chromatin modifications and epigenetics at the NIH, the uh, text we read through was a text uh, written by Gary Felsenfeld, who is a very senior researcher at the NIH. He was actually Michael Behe's um, supervisor at the NIH. <laughs> Something very interesting. They are able to surgically modify, you can barely see it in this picture. They're able to modify the uh, cilia in the uh, direction it turned or the, 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 the polarization of the cilia. And that polarization was inherited in subsequent generations, which okay. is really awesome. So that's an example of non-DNA inheritance. Cool. And that's in my, uh, the reference, I don't have it off the top of my head. Look up Gary Felsenfeld's epigenetics and paramecium. I just had to throw that in there. Uh, for future reference. So, so that's one thing about journal clubbing. 
uh, people will probably just say, oh, wait, wait a second. There's something interesting. It's off topic, but let's save it for another day. And that's one of those. So if they haven't shown that paramecium, I wouldn't have that little data point. So file that away, Emery. That's just really cool, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Uh, by the way, that that sparked my whole interest in non-DNA inheritance and what they call cortical inheritance. And that's one example. That's a powerful example of non-DNA inheritance. And those first year eukaryotes may depart significantly from what most scientists expected. If some recent findings or any indication, earlier this month, one team presented evidence that a signature event in eukaryotic evolution, the development of the organelles called mitochondria, might have unfolded quite differently than was theorized. Meanwhile, other researchers have suggested that the earliest ancestor of all eukaryotes might not have been a single cell at all, but rather a mixed population of cells that avidly swap DNA. The difference is subtle, but it might be important for understanding the evolution and diversity of the eukaryotes we see today. So let me pause here. What is not clear in this discussion is, are they saying then that um, uh, that not all life emerged from the same primordial cell? Or uh, you see, that's not, this is where it's a little bit funny where it could be kind of read either way. They're not being very uh, outright and explicit. I mean, are we to suppose then that uh, there are multiple independent origins of life and there was a pool? So it's not completely clear if they're ruling out universal common ancestry altogether. That's the way I read it. So I just want to be fair here, but still, for creationists, I think this is heartening news. Yeah, it, it, the way it's reading, I think they're they're open to the possibility that multiple there might be multiple origins for the most recent common ancestor of eukaryotes. Now they would say that they're all single cell origins, but they're getting closer. They're getting closer. <laughs> yeah, this Slowly. is. They're sounding more creationist-like oh, every day. Oh, and before I forget, uh, in a subsequent show, I had an interaction with Dr. Dan on Guts Gibbons' channel. Uh, it was either after the debate with Cy Gart or uh, another show. And I asked Dr. Dan, do you believe all proteins came from a single protein ancestor? He said, why would I believe that? He, he said, no. So I'm going to cover that. I'm going to have a whole show on that because in our, my last talk with Emery, I was pointing out that there's no protein universal common ancestor. No one believes that as far as I could tell. And we have Dr. Dan on record, at least in text chat saying that if he wants to add nuances to that, he's welcome to come on my channel and clarify, but that's also another heartening development. So that orchard model of the creationists is looking better every day, isn't it? Yeah, it's looking a lot better. <laughs> okay, the ancestral eukaryotes. The very first cells, the first life forms on this planet were prokaryotes, but they were not all alike. Even early on, two very distinct lineages emerged, the archaea and the bacteria. The archaea might have been the first to thrive because even now they can survive in extreme environments like hot vents and super saline pools. But it's also possible that archaea and bacteria split from the first cells at the same time and began to diversify independently from the start. Figuring out definitively when and how the split occurred is probably impossible given how much time has passed. Fossil evidence is non-existent and organisms from both branches have swapped genes extensively through horizontal gene transfer as opposed to vertical transfer of genes down through the generation, which generations, which complicates analyses of their genomic history. What we do know is that the story of eukaryotes began when some rogue, rogue archaeal cell split from the rest and founded what was long considered an entirely new domain of life. Quote, first and fundamentally, we are a very strange kind of archaea 
said Maureen O'Malley, a philosopher of biology affiliated with the University of Bordeaux and the University of S Sydney. It would be a struggle to distinguish the cells of this first eukaryotic common ancestor, or FECA as such. FECA is first eukaryotic common ancestor. Things I learned today. Okay, I learned a new acronym, FECA, FECA. Hmm. It didn't yet have a nucleus, for example. It didn't have mitochondria to convert sugars and other molecules into more metabolically usable forms of energy. It didn't even have microtubules, the structural proteins in eukaryotic cells that allow for compartmentalization by enabling the cell to shuttle things where they need to go. Hey, I just learned something. I didn't know that um, it just said microtubules. Where did it say that? Microtubules, the structural proteins in eukaryotic cells. I, I'm embarrassed to say this. I, I was under the impression microtubules existed in prokaryotes. So um, I could, this is, this is why it's good to do journal clubbing. <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, see, now I need to look that up. No one, uh, let me see. So this is just, there she is. The philosopher of biology, Maureen O'Malley, takes a broad view of eukaryotic ev evolution. Given the diversity among known eukaryotes, she argues, their last common answer can't have been a single cell. No one really knows how eukaryotes came to possess those and other traits common to all eukaryotes, but absent from other forms of life. But in a report in Nature Microbiology last week, a team of researchers from Europe and the US offered a new theory about one of those milestones, the development of mitochondria. For decades, researchers have known that mitochondria are derived from bacteria that became internal symbionts of archaeal, archaeal cells, but details of how that happened have been sketchy. Let me pause here a little bit. This has been, uh, it's been valuable to read things like this and also interact with researchers. I was under the mistaken impression that theory was that prokaryote, I mean, eukaryotes evolved from bacteria. So this is my third encounter with uh, the idea that eukaryotes are kind of evolved archaea. Um, Again, I'm embarrassed to say that I, you know, I, I got set straight when I took my cell biology class, but just mm. goes to show that um, the value of kind of going through this kind of in a formal methodical way, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, I'm sorry. No, no, I agree. I'm just agreeing with you. Oh, thank you. Because uh, it, it's easy to develop a misunderstanding of things and just having contacts and being with researchers on the other side uh, who are evolutionists and also going through methodically through literature kind of clears up things. Anja Spang, a microbial ecologist at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research, Vij Etema, a microbiologist studying genome evolution at Uppsala University in Sweden, and their colleagues sought clues by looking at metabolic capabilities among the Asgard archaea a superphylum that was discovered only a few years ago and is generally recognized as having the most in common with eukaryotes. The scientists concluded that mitochondria most likely arose out of a partnership between archaeal, archaeal cells that fermented certain small organic molecules and alpha protobacteria that survived by oxidizing other ones. The bacteria could use the electrons and hydrogen that archaeal archaeal cells shed as wastes. The researchers call this the reverse flow model because according to a previously popular theory, the bacteria would have donated hydrogen to the archaea's metabolism. So here's a diagram here. New thoughts on mitochondrial origins. The energy producing organelles called mitochondria evolved out of a symbiosis between ancient prokaryotes, one or more bacteria and an archaeal cell but new research suggests that scientists may have been wrong about the nature of that original partnership. And genetic contributions from other bacteria may have been essential to the further evolution of mitochondria. So we have the previous model here 
we have bacteria. It looks like it's uh, parts of it are going the, into the archaeal cell. So previous model, number one, symbiosis. Bacteria consumed organic molecules and passed hydrogen and carbon dioxide to archaeal cells. And then um, the reverse flow model, uh, symbiosis, archaeal cells consumed organic molecules and passed hydrogen and electrons and reduced compounds to bacteria. Oh my goodness, this is uh, biochemistry and a little bit of organic. I mm -hmm. have to review this. So. <laughs> O-chem and biochem were my two most hated classes in college. So, yeah. <laughs> so let me just try to, because if I'm struggling through this, I know some people in the audience are. So the model before was bacteria consumed or organic molecules. The reverse flow model, now it's archaea consumed. And so basically, which one is the, uh, the one that's eating? <laughs> Yeah. All right. So now the old model is archaea internalized their bacterial symbionts and the endosymbiosis and evolved into eukaryotes with my mitochondria. So we have that green thing. So I presume the green thing is the bacteria and it got eaten mm -hmm. by the archaea. So now the new model, proposed model is the endosymbiotic cells received horizontal transfer of genes from other bacteria, changing their chemical roles as they evolved into eukaryotes with mitochondria. Whoa. So they've essentially made this much more complicated because they couldn't account for all the genes. Um, because now you not, don't just get, you don't just have to swallow whatever it is that has the mitochondria in it you have to swallow it and then incorporate genes from other bacteria yep. via and, horizontal transfer. And I'm going to point out there are even way more problems with this. This was again with the localization problem. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah. This is why, why this is good. So it looks like they still accept endosymbiosis here, mm -hmm. but then the, uh, the way they can account for the strange features is to have other parts. Okay. I'm just going to pause here just to take a little break. Um, when I start hearing stories like this and it's like, okay, so you think Noah's flood is outrageous. Okay. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. Um, I mean that, you know, this looks reasonably plausible. It's not as outrageous as a multi-universe as, as an explanation for the origin of life. Okay. But I, uh, when, when I have another segment, I hope, when I'll talk about all the localization signals, I said, guys, this is just going to be nuts because the mitochondria has a lot of genes that are in the eukaryotic nucleus. It's like, so let, let's even accept all of this model. Um, eukaryotic evolution is nowhere out of the woods. Uh, in, in fact, that localization problem, I think is just, uh, it's a deal breaker for me. I sooner believe in Noah's flood at that point because mm -hmm. it, yep. it would require such miracles and I don't think they've, they're willing to deal with it, but I'm glad they're at least advancing. They're going this far. So anyway, such associations could render growth on some small organic substrates more favorable, Spang and Atema explained in, in an email. For example, some modern archaea that live under oxygen-free conditions and metabolize hydrocarbons depend on bacteria to accept their electrons. I learned something. Hmm. A similar type of interaction may have characterized the presumed archaeal, archaeal ancestor of eukaryotes. So let me read that again. Modern archaea that live in oxygen-free conditions and metabolize hydro hydrocarbons depend on bacteria to accept their electrons. This is also something that has struck me, that uh, the whole ecosystem, there's a lot of stuff with ecosystems that if we don't have certain creatures, uh, other creatures are definitely dead. And um, I, I saw that the whole thing with nitrogen fixing. So I'm just, that's just a mm -hmm. passing note. Over time, horizontal transfer of genes from other bacteria would have provided more of the machinery for the metabolic processes performed by mitochondria as we know them. Meanwhile, gene transfers between archaeal hosts and their bacterial symbiotes, along with the loss of some superfluous genes on each side, 
would have cemented what had been separate symbiotic cells into a permanently unified eukaryotic state. I'm sorry, I'm just going to do a little bit of a bunny trail here because mm -hmm. it sparked something. I was talking about the symbiotic, uh, I mean, the ecological things. One thing I learned in biochemistry class is that nitrogen fixing is really hard. We have this Haber process to, to make ammonia, and we have to heat things to like 500 degrees Celsius under a lot of pressure to be able to get atmospheric nitrogen to be um, in ammonia, a, a form that biological organisms can consume. And uh, it, it's not likely an ammonia atmosphere would last very long. So the problem is, how do we have life without fixed... Um, without fixed nitrogen. It's almost a chicken and egg paradox. So uh, we need bacteria to, to do nitrogen fixing and bacteria wouldn't exist unless nitrogen were fixed. So, sorry, I just had to point that out. It sparked something. Uh, as I was reading that, I said I had to mention that. So the researchers note that although this theory could explain the origin of the mitochondrion, it is silent on the other origins of other important organelles. Suppose, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <Kinda>. supposedly, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> supposedly, we should start referring to a eukaryotic cell once the nucleus has evolved. Uh, yeah, uh, Spang and Etema wrote, at this point, it is still unclear whether this happened before or after mitochondrial endosymbiosis. Um, I'm sorry, I really have to pause here now. So, over the last few weeks, I was saying this nuclear pore complex and all the localization signals at the RNA and protein level, this is a serious problem. You can't just have like a, a lipid bilayer and, and then suddenly have a nucleus. Uh, there has to be controlled input and exit and it's just gonna be a mess. So I, that's why I'm gonna hammer eukaryotic evolution, particularly the nucleus. Just, uh, do you have any thoughts? Emory? Um, I mean, I mean, the level of complexity here that we have to, that we're dealing with, you can't just throw together a lipid bilayer and say, and call it good enough. And by the way, a lipid bilayer is not even remotely enough, but not only is it, it's not even remotely simple. Like a lipid bilayer, it's, you can go into much more detail on this than, than I could, but lipid bilayer, you could get, you, you'd start digging down into that and you'll come up with all kinds of complexity that is built into the lipid bilayer. Um, that's just the lipid bilayer. And you start talking about uh, the various, uh, you can, like a, a membrane bound nucleus is not just, you know, you can't just create that by endosymbiosis. It doesn't work that way. Um, you, you can't, you can't just have that happen. You know, it requires very specialized protein folding. It requires very specialized, uh, uh, sorry, my, my sick brain is not functioning correctly. It requires very specialized uh, instructions and it requires very specialized, uh, not molding, I'm, pieces of puzzle fitting together. I'm sure there's a shorter way to say that. But uh, there's, there's, it requires this very specialized instruction manual, if you will, to put it all together. Um, and, and that's just, you're not going to be able to do that uh, with the way this, and the quote, I mean, at this point, it's still unclear whether this happened before or after mitochondrial endosymbiosis. Yeah. And, and you know, what, you, what good is endosymbiosis without a nucleus? And what good is a nucleus without endosymbiosis? I mean, really? Yeah. You see, th th this, this is clarifying something. People say, well, this is how eukaryotes evolved endosymbiosis. I'm just like, well, that doesn't explain the nucleus. And, and, and so evolutionists have been changing the subject, dodging the real problems and making it like it's solved. I said, that does not explain the nucleus. Mm -hmm. it, but you'll see it in textbook. This is, you know, they'll represent it. It's like, oh, look at all the papers on eukaryotic evolution. We figured it out. And then you actually read the papers and you're just like, no, that's not the case. This is one reason we have to go through the primary literature because the way it's represented on the internet and popular literature or uh, off the cuff comments, which unfortunately dominate a lot of the conversation, uh, it doesn't square with the, what the actual literature says. Yep. Yeah. yeah the, the, and unfortunately, this happens a lot. And this is an issue that, that 
really people need to be more aware of. Uh, a lot of times what's reported in the pop side literature or even what the headline is, and even what researchers will say to the pop side literature does not match what is actually in the peer reviewed literature. So folks, for those of you who are never going to be scientists and never going to like nerd out about this stuff the way Sal and I do, that's fine, but just re realize, take the pop sci literature with a healthy dose of skepticism. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And I, I'm just gonna stand on my soapbox a little bit here. The evolutionists will say, well, you know, Sal, what you're doing is argument from ignorance. I'm just like, no, it's argument from contradiction. Mm -hmm. This requires a miracle, and I can lay out all the, uh, we were just kind of touching on all the mechanical things that have to simultaneously be there, otherwise the creature's dead. But we'll save the details for another talk. And so we'll just move on. <clears throat> this has actually been very educational. So I did not know about this until like one or two weeks ago when you mentioned your professor said, nah, no one believes eukaryotes have a common ancestor anymore. I'm just like, whoa, okay. So we're, we're trying to represent what that may really mean. And I still think it's not entirely clear where they believe that there was one primordial cell from which all cells came from. If you, if you dig down further into this article, which we may run out of time to do, um, they, uh, the appeal seems to be to a population. They're arguing from a pan genome, um, which I don't know. It's unclear whether they mean, I, I presume by population, they mean it's of the same species, but that was an awful big pan genome for the same species. At least it seems like it is, but anyway, yeah. go on. Oh, this is going to be, I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, however, uh, I mean, it is a little frustrating. And so, I would just be reluctant to say, okay, this proves a lack of universal common ancestry. And, and, and unless I get a really direct quote and say, there's no universal common ancestry, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to try to project that into what they say. Obviously, I don't believe in a universal common ancestor. Nevertheless, this is encouraging. They also note that if ancient archaea did start adopting some eukaryotic features before the symbiosis with alpha pro proteobacteria began, it might have helped the transition. Filaments of the protein actin, for example, could have stabilized contacts between the hosts and symbionts and improved coupling in their of their metabolisms. Overall, the genesis of eukaryotes remains mysterious <laughs> because all eukaryotes alive today arose from an organism that was already complex. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, somehow, over an unknown number of millennia, Feca turned into the last eukaryotic ancestor, or Lika, an organism ancestral to every other subsequent eukaryote, living or extinct, extinct, including ones currently unknown to science. Lika is a lot easier to imagine because it probably looked similar to some of today's microbial eukaryotes. It turns out that everything that has a nucleus has mitochondria, a Golgi apparatus, and everything else, said W. Ford Doolittle, a molecular biologist at Dal 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 Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. Leka appears to have already been fairly a fairly sophisticated eukaryotic cell. In fact, Leka is seemingly so straightforward that some say it's downright boring. The one thing that nobody really bothers to argue about at all is the nature of the last eukaryotic common ancestor, said Anthony Poole, a molecular evolutionist at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Okay, so now I'm just getting a little confused. It's all right, I'm just going to point that out. Maybe it'll cl clear up as we read it because it seems now like they're arguing for one Next sentence. <laughs> oh, so there's a feca and then there's a leca. Okay. So are they saying, let, let me, I'm sorry to have to do this. That's fine, that's fine. So they, are they saying there may have been a LECA, but there may, may have been multiple FECA? That, okay. Oh, oh my. So there may have been multiple FECA and only one LECA? All right. Uh, so let's just suffice to say, let's uh, 
file that away <laughs> for later. Are we okay with that? Um, yeah, we'll pass on that one for now. That, we'll I mean, pass on that one for now. Yeah, we we'll may have to come back to that one. Okay, so now it says, uh, and again, this is a science writer for Popular Science. So, um, uh, th th that adds more confusion factors sometimes. Except some are bothering to argue about it because LECA is usually discussed as one cell, the singular ancestor of all eukaryotes. To a Mali, that's wrong. She, quote, obviously Le LECA can't have been a single cell, she said. Okay, this is maybe clarifying it. That error, she thinks, comes from people thinking about the genealogy too simplistically and confusing ancestry with ancestors. Um, I didn't know that there was a distinction. Okay. Um, genealogical thinking just picks out that lineage with all its divisions back to a sing to that single cell lineage. In an essay for Nature Ecology and Evolution, O'Malley and her colleagues discussed the implications if LECA was not a single cell, but really a population of genetically diverse cells, none of which had all the characteristics associated with eukaryotes today. Quote, when we're talking about LECA, we probably are, we're probably talking about an ancestral state, a genomic state that we don't know was one single cell, O'Malley said. Quote, what we really wanted to do with this paper was just generally start a conversation between people working on reconstructing the last eukaryotic common ancestor to think how they could conceive of LECA and whether they could imagine that the genetic variation in a hypothetical population might explain some of the patterns that they see, explained Ledger, who is co-author on the paper. O'Malley, Ledger, and their colleagues argue that to truly understand LECA and decode its genome and to get a more complete picture of what all eukaryotes are, we need to understand what the ancient population was like. One cell or many, Bill Wicksteed of University of Nottingham and his colleagues are those trying to reconstruct LECA. Their effort centers on building a proteome, the complete collection of proteins that LECA was probably capable of making. This is done by taking genomes and proteomes from diverse eukaryotic lineages and using statistics to determine which traits are more, most likely to have been present in their common ancestor and which arose as independent evolutionary in innovations or passed horizontally among lineages. Molecular biology like this offers the best hope for revealing LECA. But uh, I keep- I'm gonna pause you real quick there, Sal. Sure. Um, so I just wanna point out to the listener here, uh, essentially what they're doing is they're taking known genomes and known proteomes from exist. So basically a genome, the genetics proteome protein sequences um, from various existing eukaryotic organisms, probably mostly single cell, I would suspect, um, and running them through a statistical program, probably a phylogenetics program, um, and trying to figure out, okay, which of these traits are common to everything, and so probably was in the common ancestor, and which ones are different. And based on pre-existing phylogenetic trees, because we, we say, okay, here, this organism goes here, this organism goes here, um, so this, this, these two diverged at this point, this one has this trait, the, the later one has this trait, this other one doesn't have the trait, so that's an evolutionary innovation. Um, but, and then stuff that's not related, but that, or is not closely related, but that shares the same traits, they would look at that and go, well, that must be because of horizontal transfer, because that, um, that one of them obvious, most likely it didn't evolve twice, therefore one of them probably horizontally transferred to the other. Again, this is completely, this is complete inference. This is not, there's nothing empirical about this. All they're doing is they're running statistics, which is nothing wrong with running statistics, but they're running statistics and try and making inferences about the results. So that's my, my quick, quick spiel. Yes. And, and um, uh, just as a personal note, I think for creationists, the young earth creationists, the way all this is settled, the, the evidence to the extent we can actually show the earth is young, all this is moot. But what this does show, the reason this is of interest is when we can show that evolutionary theory 
still has problems even on the assumption of an old earth and even long ages, it, 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 it begins to at least support the intelligent design model. Mm. Um, and we'll, we'll go into that more, but um, it, it's not like their models are as, say, problem-free as it may seem in the popular, uh, in the popular consciousness. So uh, if we could pause for just a moment, I'm going to pause the uh, recording. Hang on. Sure. Uh, let me see if I can pause the... I'm just going to pause the recording. All right, I'm back. So we'll just keep reading through this. But a key point about this approach, Wickstead says, is that it doesn't strictly matter whether the ancestral proteome and genome it deduces is in a single cell or if it's distributed across a population of them. It's a statistical exploration of genomic data that doesn't trace back cellular divisions. All right, I'm gonna get back on my soapbox a little bit. It's like, so it doesn't matter whether we assume universal common ancestry or not. <laughs> what good does it do? And I've been trying to say that. How much different would biology be if we just assume common design? It doesn't make a difference. The only people it would make difference to is evolutionary biologists, but it doesn't. A lot of those. Uh, I'm sorry. There's an awful lot of those. Yeah. From the point of view of the LECA genome, it really makes no difference whether LECA was an individual cell or a collection of cells that ex that exchange genes in addition to replicating. Uh, Wickstead said. But as O'Malley and Wickstead both, po both point out, this distinction is not just a matter of semantics. Whether the genome gets reconstructed from the current data was in one cell or spread across many of them is vital to understanding how that genome was used, basically. Was used. Basically, it's the difference between genetics and cell biology, Wickstead says. And so, there's a picture, it says, that looks like Michelle Ledger. Modern genetic sequencing technologies make this an incredibly exciting time for probing the early life history. According to Michelle Ledger, a researcher at the Institute of Evolutionary Biology in Barcelona, Spain. He and his colleagues are mostly interested in reconstructing LECA's genome and proteome to understand what biological abilities it had. But it does, quote, but it does make a, a difference, really, to think about whether or not they could all exist within an individual cell, or if you would have to break them out, because there would be conflicts within that, he said. Ledger, Ledger arg agrees that knowing whether LECA was one cell or many would help researchers make better sense of the genomic data. If you try to look at all of the features that are commonly shared by many eukaryotes today, and you try to reconstruct which, feature, which features should have been present in the last eukaryotic common ancestor, going from just those features, you end up with, a la with the last eukaryotic common ancestor cell that has an impossibly large genome encoding far too many proteins to be normal, she said. That is the bombshell right there. Mm-hmm. Are you going to have a eukaryote that has basically, uh, this is the orphan gene problem, and I've talked about it, and I'm glad I'm revisiting it. We found that many of these huge ta taxonomic groups have like 30% unique to them. If we establish that they're ancient, you're going to have a eukaryotic cell that has maybe millions of genes <laughs> for, for no good reason, except that, well, you want to you want to keep common ancestry, and so I thought about this today. It's like, well, couldn't you just get these genes along the way? Uh, why does does it have to be in a um, common ancestor? So apparently, what they have done is they they've made a case that these genes have to be very ancient, very very ancient, uh, using their phylogenetic techniques, and and. So then I guess if they pose that the ancientness of these genes also corresponds to the LECA, it's like, well, then do you have a LECA with uh, an insanely large genome of like millions of genes? So this is tough research. I got to commend them. That's not easy to, 
the accounting problem of this is going to be enormously, it's just a nightmare. Yep. So um, even though I disagree with their evolutionary views, I, I do respect the effort that they had to go through because I only study like five genes <laughs> and that's a headache enough. These guys are probably surveying millions. So imagine trying to keep all that straight. I mean, can you imagine how big the spreadsheet is with just the gene names in it? Yeah. I mean, I mean, some people live to work with spreadsheets, I guess, but good night. I, I, I like genetics, but I ain't doing this. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, I mean, this is, um, I mean, this would be also kind of distasteful me, to me personally. It's so hard just to understand one protein in one gene. Mm -hmm. And this is such, they would have to, as ne out of necessity, have to be pretty superficial in yeah. their understanding of what each gene does. And I mean, I, I want to say again, uh, I totally respect all the accounting that they had to do to tally all this yeah. up. But that's the bomb right there. And Paul Nelson saw this way back in 2013 when he talked about the orphan gene problem. Um, and of, of course, evolutionary biologists will kind of equivocate the meaning. The better term is taxonomically restricted genes. But uh, this is, I've seen this come up and I'm glad it's being repeated. So I'm just going to repeat the paragraph or half the paragraph. You end up, okay, so if you try to look at all of the features that are commonly shared by many eukaryotes today, and you try to reconstruct which features should have been present in the last eukaryotic common ancestor, going from just those features, you end up with the last eukaryotic common ancestor cell that has an impossibly large genome encoding far too many proteins to be normal. Uh, yeah, that, the, the, this is another, uh, yeah, this is really interesting. A similar, and this is why it's a bombshell, a similar problem arises with a more familiar organism, the common bacterium, Escherichia coli, E. coli, which is a single species divided into many genetic strains. If you take the genome from multiple strains of E. coli, or E. coli, it's clear that different strains have different genes, not just different variants of genes, but entire gene families that are present or absent in various cell lines. Each individual bacterium has a genome of roughly 4,200 to 5,600 genes. Somewhere between 2,200 and 3,100 of, of those are found in all E. coli. The rest are drawn from a total pool of at least 89,000 possible accessory genes. And although they're not central to the core existence of the bacteria, they influence its survival in many ways. The variation in the thousands of accessory genes explains why some strains are virulent while others are harmless and how some can survive in certain habitats or in food sources that others can't. Accessory genes can be horizontally passed from one strain to another. So if we want to understand the total capabilities of E. coli as an organism, we need a complete picture of the genomic variation in the species or what researchers call a pangenome. Now, I'm gonna pause here and say, I don't know where they're going with this, but this is a serious problem because this is E. coli with 89,000 possible accessory genes. If these are unique to the E. coli family, think about all the other um, bacteria out there, the prokaryotes. We haven't maybe, uh, uh, and I may be getting this wrong. My understanding is we haven't even sequenced 1% of all the uh, bacterial organisms in existence. That sounds about right from the little bit of reading I've done. So, and we haven't cataloged all the genes. Are we talking about a universal common ancestor maybe that has all these, I mean, if they, if they're going to argue that these are also ancient, we could end up with a universal common ancestor. that is just going to be insanely gigantic. Now they could say that these genes arose later. So this is going to be a very interesting discussion of like now, okay. now, they would get around some of this yeah problem by horizontal gene transfer um so uh, they would probably get around this the eighty nine thousand number 
by at least some of those via horizontal transfer. But I would really like to see you get, account for 89,000 genes by horizontal transfer. At that point, believing in the global flood sounds simple. <laughs> yeah. So just suffice to say, okay, I wouldn't say this is a slam dunk for creationism, but this is, this is encouraging. This is encouraging because they're starting to recognize if they assume universal common ancestry, um, they end up being in a very difficult position. And I don't know how they were able to infer this. I would have thought that they could just say, oh, well, the genes kind of came along later. But the problem they're facing is if they have to postulate for whatever reason that the genes are ancient and had to be in the common ancestor, um, that become, makes it really difficult. So can you imagine an E. coli with 89,000 <laughs> genes? That's just, um, and, and there could be like say um, um, families of these that have just insane number of uh, genes in the common ancestor. Uh, so um, again, this is not my specialty. Some people will say some of it was de novo along the way that evolved after the common ancestor and I'm fine with that. But I don't know how they're able to sort out what would be considered ancient versus kind of a, a later innovation. And that's a question I'm going to let them resolve. But to me, it's telling that they're starting to think this way because Paul Nelson had seen this. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I, this is not an area I'm not, you know, I don't have, uh, I just, I, you know, uh, the five proteins I study is about really my specialty. I, I can't get into this in any detail, but this is interesting. Anyway, we'll just continue. A complex lineage for eukaryotes. So they said one common ancestor. Genealogical recon reconstructions of early eukaryotes usually treat ancestral cells as unique individuals. All known eukaryotes would have traits derived from a common ancestor that had them all. So this is Wurlika, and it has traits A, B, C, D, E, F. All, new, all known eukaryotic cells evolve from one common ancestor. So this was the one common ancestor view. In ancestral population, researchers are now considering what it might mean if early common ancestors were really diverse populations of cells that swap genes extensively. No single cell would have had all the ancestral traits. So uh, traits are A, B, C, D, E, F, and they're dispersed. And then we can have uh, something that looks like that. All known eukaryotic cells evolved from a diverse genetically linked population. So that's just kind of repeating what Yeah, it's a nice graphical been. example for anybody who didn't get the concept going earlier um, of, of what we're talking about. So on the, on the left-hand side, if you're looking at the screen, um, it is the, the, the model that is, has been traditionally taught, a single common ancestor that led to the, uh, all the existing eukaryotic cells. Where on the right-hand side is no, is the model that's kick, being kicked around right now and that is being kicked around in this article where, no, there wasn't a single cell common ancestor. What you have was a bunch of different cells that didn't have all the traits. And by mixing and matching the genes from those cells, we get the various traits that we see today. It's just a graphical illustration for those of you who are more visual. Well, again, I love getting on the soapbox. So what's the point of insisting of universal common ancestry at all? Uh, th that's, um, what I'm, that's what I'm getting at this. It's like, uh, so how science advanced? Because it doesn't seem to really matter. The only people that it really matters to are evolutionary biologists trying to decide what happened in the distant past. But it doesn't change how we do biology today, as far as I could tell. Because if it were that critical, um, we'd be changing how we do business because it's like, oh, you know, now people are saying, some people are saying that it could be multiple origins. Has that changed the way we do medical research? Not one iota. So I'm just like, well, so people are, my point is, is if people are saying, oh, the theory of evolution is so necessary for biology, this is proof against it. They can keep changing their story. It doesn't change the way we do biology one iota. So that's me on my soapbox. And that is why we can have creationist biology students they can succeed because all of this stuff doesn't matter 
for operational biology. Mm -hmm. If anything, and I've tried to point this out, uh, we're more, the creationists are more free to accept things like maybe our genomes are deteriorating <laughs> and, uh -huh. and uh, we can accept that maybe the so-called junk DNA isn't junk. We're a little bit freer to just like deal with the data without being um, shackled by uh, evolutionary dogma. So anyway, the, the uh, continuing on, the concept of a pangenome arose in the early 2000s when scientists realized that reference genome sequences of pathogenic bacteria, the digital databases compiled as standardized descriptions of their genomes, failed to capture the total genetic variation of the organisms. Since then, scientists have realized that pan genomes also play an important role in prokaryotic life. But since the sharing of genes through horizontal gene transfer is much less common in eukaryotes, it's long been assumed that pangenomes have only limited relevance to understanding eukaryotic species. That view is slowly changing. A recent analysis of genomes from four medically important path pathogenic fungal species found that they too have pangenomes. 10 to 20% of their genome is comprised of accessory genes responsible for important traits like resistance to antimicrobial compounds. So fungi are eukaryotes, they're not prokaryotes. Mm -hmm. Even our species has a pan, even our species has a pan genome. Oh, things I learned today, I didn't know that. When we first sequenced the human genome, it was hailed as fantastic. We now have the blueprint for all humans, but of course we didn't, Wickstead said. A recent study found that nearly 10% of the genes from 910 African people, uh, 910 people of African descent weren't in the human reference genome, for example. Whoa, I did not know that. This is news to me. Now, um, this, it's news to me, but it doesn't surprise me. Okay, just for the reader's benefit, I did not read this article in advance. I, you're, you're, you guys are getting it as raw as I'm getting through it. I mean, I scanned a few parts, but I didn't read this in detail. So this is why it's kind of shocking to me. Like, I didn't know that. 10% no, of genes? 10% of genes? That's a lot. It, yeah, that is a lot. But I'll be surprised if the number doesn't go higher. And the reason I say this is it, there, there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons. One of which being it depends on what, what definition of gene they're working with. That's rather important. Um, but just supposing that they're going with a standard definition of gene that's not like whacked out and out there. Um, because there are a few of those. Um, it does not surprise me that a genome that was assembled, you know, however many years ago that was, and I forget exactly when they finished assembling the first human genome, does not surprise me that it doesn't represent the entire diversity of, of, the humans, of humanity. Um, because we know for a fact that a large, that a, a significant portion mm -hmm. of humanity um, has Neanderthal DNA but not everybody does. Um, we know that, and, but we also, uh, but that also kind of leads me to the, the supposition, this is kind of a guess more than anything, that when Neanderthals quote unquote died out, genes went with them. Um, and it does not surprise me also, for example, that people living in Central Africa might have different genes in some areas that aren't accounted for in the reference genome than maybe people living in Scandinavia, right? They, 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 have, different, they have different lifestyles, different uh, skin tones, different hair colors. Um, and I mean, hair colors under the control of, I think, what, 10 or 11 genes or something like that. So um, it does not surprise me that some of these genes that, that they did not, that 10%, honestly, I think that number will go up. I will be surprised if that number stops short of 15, maybe even 20%, because humans are very diverse. Um, and this is something that you see a lot in, in the animal world as well. There's a lot more diversity within a species than there is between species. And obviously there's only one species of human. But if you go to something like, I, I don't know, you want to pick pick on something easy like uh, ferrets. You want to pick on, because I could, I could have picked on cats and dogs. It would have been probably a little bit easier. But um, I was trying to avoid those. Uh, you want, I mean, ferrets are a subspecies of a wild 
Um, oh, good heavens. Of a wild mustelid. There we go. I, I knew I was going to come up with it. And they are, they come in, you know, they're albino. They come in natural colors and all kinds of different stuff. Yet they're all the, still the same species. You could look at them and you, you, you can't always tell that they're the same species, but you can look at them and, they, yep, they're the same species. And yet, if you compared them next to put a wild ferret versus, you know, a different member of the same genus, you'd look at it and go, oh my goodness, those two look nothing alike. I mean, the general body plan's the same, but the coloration, the shape, like, oh my goodness, what on earth? And, and this is something I, I, so it does not surprise me that there is a great deal of diversity in the, in the human uh, uh, genome. That, that doesn't surprise me in the least. This is also raises something interesting. Now, I don't know exactly how I'm sharing my screen, whether I'm sharing a window or my um, uh, my actual screen. Can you tell me what you're seeing? Does it say a toasted genetic diversity of grapes? Uh, yes, it does. It does. Okay, now I know that I'm sharing one of my monitors. I took a cell biology class, and the, uh, it was taught by the dean of the school, and she just passed this on. It wasn't part of the textbook, but it shocked me. Um, it, it shocked me that um, uh, th this is related. Um, and it may indicate genetic deterioration. So it, it says here, each of us has one copy of their gene from their mother and one from their father, said Professor Goff. One would assume that grapes inherit two copies of every gene too, with one coming from each of their two parents. However, we found just one copy, not two, for 15% of the genes in Chardonnay. And it was also true for Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. Therefore, that means that grape varieties differ in the presence of or absence of thousands of genes. So <clears throat> going back to this, uh, to the article of interest, I am surprised we're not seeing kind of like just like uh, one gene on one chromosome. How could it be lost on two? So that's an interesting question in and of itself. Um, well, so it's a little bit easier on a purebred strain to lose the same chromosome on the same gene on, on both chromosomes. Wow. Um, uh, and you know where I'm headed. You know where I'm kind of headed with this. Yeah, I, I think so. I'll let you go there rather than, than break it up for you. <laughs> Okay, uh, you tell me if you think we're on the same track. This is an indication of genetic deterioration, both in grapes what? and in Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you I mean, think of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're on the same page. Um, I pointed this out to some people, and they said, yeah, I didn't know it was that bad, that the gene loss was that severe. So there are various mechanisms for that. I threw this in front of plant biologists. I could tell it gave him pause. It's like it was a punch to the gut. And I, I said, well, at this rate, how, how do we have any, you know, at this rate of gene loss, how are we going to sustain? We're talking about eukaryotes that don't have like the plasmid transfer mechanisms and horizontal mechanisms that bacteria have. So, yep. Anyway, let's go on. This is, by the way, I'm so glad we're talking, we're doing this. This is so compelling. I'm learning so much in this process. Mm -hmm. It, uh, if extant eukaryotes have pangenomes and extant prokaryotes do too, it would be odd to think that early eukaryotes didn't. The genome that Wickstead and other scientists reconstruct when they try to deduce what Lika looked like is probably that pangenome. That all makes sense to P, uh, J. Peter Gogarten, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Connecticut. To him, the paper by O'Malley, Ledger, and colleagues crystallizes the idea that, quote, to understand the origin of eukaryotes, we might need to move beyond, we might need to move beyond reconstructing the tree of cells, amen, um, and instead focus on the network that describes the genome's evolutionary history. That's something he's been advocating for a while, he says. He thinks that moving away from looking at Lika as a single cell and recognizing it as a population of different cells might help us peer even further back into evolutionary history to the mysterious first eukaryotes. Still, even Gogarten sets limits to that speculation. Lika may have been a population of cells, but he says he's not convinced 
it was a large population with a vast and diverse pan genome. Larger populations, larger pan, pan genomes, or, or, or both likely came into play during the transition between Theca and Leca, which is why viewing these ancestor populations rather than as individuals may help to illuminate the origins of eukaryotes. But Gogarten thinks that by the time Lika existed, things had become more settled. Poole agrees, not many of the features that most experts would consider to be critical for Lekka, he said, are compatible with a pangenome explanation for their diversity. Quote, we don't have a model where we say, you're sharing half a ribosome each across two cells, because that's just physically implausible. Okay, um, I don't completely understand that um, paragraph right there. What Sal, I can think I take a shot at it? Oh yeah, go for it. Okay, so this is something I might actually be a little bit more familiar with than you because I had the, the genetics class fairly recently. So um, with, with the, and that's a rare thing, so I'm kind of excited about it. Um, <laughs> so um, basically what he's, what he's getting at here with the pan genome is, is that the individual above is saying that um, going from FECA to LECA that the, the population had kind of stabilized a little bit and there wasn't quite as much diversity and there wasn't quite as much going on. Um, and then this, this, this gentleman, Anthony Poole, comes in and, and he thinks and, and he thinks that um, the, the pan genome model is stretching in some respects. And the reason he thinks that is um, certain aspects of LECA, of the, the most recent common ancestor of eukaryotes or the last eukaryote common ancestor, I think is how it's phrased, um, could only have been in one cell. For example, the original ribosome could only have been in one cell. The original, uh, you know, filling the other Golgi body could have only been in one cell. And those are things that could not have been just um, horizontally transferred. Now you could transfer the genes to make those things, but you have to get the genes, you have to originate the genes to make them, which creates a whole nother chicken and egg problem, which came first, the thing that copies the genes, the ribosome, or the thing that makes the thing that copies the genes. You know, it creates all kinds of problems. Um, go ahead. I can see you want to oh, say Oh, that. please go, go on. I'm going to throw in something after you're done. Okay. Um, and, and so that's what Poole's getting at, is he, he's essentially saying that the pan genome doesn't explain everything for the last, uni last eukaryotic common ancestor. Um, he, he thinks that, he think, basically, I think what he's say, getting at is he's saying that he doesn't think it explains everything, but it might be useful for certain things is what he's driving at, I think. I think. He'd have to clarify that if he was sitting here. So. Okay, so this raises something that changed hand. I'm gonna throw another monkey wrench in it too because we're too good a point not to mention this. And, and if I'm a little clumsy in describing this, it's because I don't completely understand it myself, but you just, every now and then you just develop an intuition that this is worth pursuing, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So let me just uh, read the uh, caption here. So this is a picture of Anthony Poole, a molecular evolutionist at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, is skeptical of the idea that the pan genome, the pool of all possible genes, could have been very large or diverse in the population of the last common eukaryotic ancestors. So apparently there's, he, he's trying to temper how big that gene pool is. Now, let me share this by change tan. And he specifically what? He said, sharing half a ribosome across two cells. This sparked something. I had a two hour conversation with change tan. And she was in contact with the authors of this article. And in that article, it said, not a single protein is conserved across all genomes. And let me just highlight the article here. Genome update, the thousandth genome, a cautionary tale. There are now more than 1,000 sequenced pro uh, prokaryotic genomes that posited in public databases and available for analysis. And they just go on and on. But they pointed out right here, 
more, moreover, of the 1,000 genomes available, okay, this is only 1,000 creatures, okay? Only 1,000 prokaryotic genomes. Remember, we've, uh, there are probably billions of these, okay? Not a single protein is conserved across all genomes. Not a single protein. Excluding the members of archaea, only a total of four genes are conserved in all bacteria. Two protein, two protein genes and two RNA genes. And my jaw dropped. I said- Universal uh, common ancestry is dead. Yeah. And I said, okay, uh, Dr. Tan, what about a polymerase? I mean, uh, uh, she said, well, first of all, that she corrected me, a polymerase is a complex of proteins. It's not a single. And I said, Dr. Tan, can we look at then the subunits? And she said, yeah, one bacteria implements the polymerase this way. Another one implements the polymerase that way. I said, about, how about a helicase? I said, no, those aren't conserved either. <laughs> Just like, okay, this is really, really bad because, you know, these are ancient, supposedly ancient architectures. And you try to tinker with that, the creature's dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and they share no, uh, they're, they're, they're only fold homologous as far as I know. They're not, they're not sequence homologous. That's very problematic. Um, because if it's conserved anciently, that means that um, natural selection would uh, resist change over time. That's just, mm -hmm. that's the definition of conserved. And of course the evolutionists say, well, maybe the selection pressure wasn't that strong in the ancestor. I said, okay, so you're imagining solutions. Uh, that's not very scientific, but maybe that's, and, if that's and, all you've got, the, that's all you got. The question then arises, why would why? it not be, not be conserved in the ancestor? I'm like, you make a mistake with that, the cell dies. Yeah. Door. I mean, no, the, 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 <laughs> you can't make a mistake with, with a hemocase or a polymerase protein. You can't do that. You, 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 you'll blow up the cell. <laughs> so, you know, this is almost worth, see this, this, this uh, sparked something in me. I want to just read this whole abstract again. There are now more than 1000 sequence prokaryotic prokaryotic genomes deposited in public databases and available for analysis. Although the sequence database, GenBank, DNA database of Japan and EMBL, that's the European uh, one, are synchronized continuously, there are slight differences in content at the genomes level for a variety of logistical reasons, including differences in format and loading errors, such as those caused by file transfer protocol interruptions. This means that the thousandth genome will be different in various databases. Some of the data on the highly accessed web pages are inaccurate, leading to false conclusions, for example, about the largest bacterial genome sequence. Biological diversity is far greater than many have thought. For example, analysis of uh, Echerichia e. Co uh, coli genomes has led to an estimate of around 45,000 gene families. And we can see already that's a dated figure because now the current number is 89,000. Mm -hmm. More genes than are recognized in the human genome. Moreover, of the 1,000 genomes available, not a single protein is conserved across all genomes, excluding members of the archaea. Only a total of four genes are conserved in all bacteria, two protein genes and two RNA genes. So let me qualify what this means. It doesn't mean that there is... Um, isn't a lot of con uh, all approximate conservation. So um, as I was going through this uh, in a private conference call with Change Tan, which uh, I want to review the data, you might get 99% of all the bacteria implementing polymerase subunits the same way. One per but then you'll have that one outlier that just does it totally different. And, and that's like, okay, so... Uh, how do you deal with that? You know, why would that happen? You know, why, why 99 and then that 1% deviation? And so that for every major gene, you have a different implementation, a totally sequence wise. So we could, we could have fold con conservation, but no sequence conservation. That's just a really odd pattern. And then not to mention that um, it wouldn't surprise me uh, like I've seen helicases that are like hexamers and then just tetramers. So 
it could be that they really do implement things very differently. So that's, let's just suffice to say, maybe that's an open question, but that's very problematic because that's only 1000 genomes. Are they going to have all these, are they going to have billions of orphan genes? Yeah, that number is going to go down. The, 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 like if it's 99% or 95% now, it's going to go down as they sequence more genomes. It's not going to go up. Uh, what's going to go down? If the number is 99% or 95% conservation right now, it's going to go down. It is not going to go up. The more yeah. genomes they sequence, it's going to go down. Yeah. Well, well th what they said is there's basically 100% there's zero percent that's conserved across all right right but i'm saying like if if there's you know 99 percent of gene x is conserved in bacteria yeah as of right now as they sequence more genomes that number is going to creep further and further and further and further away from 100 and gets lower and lower and lower yeah and that that would be an interesting that that's an interesting hypothesis now if it does that's going to be shocking uh so like, yeah, so much for the utility of common ancestry. What, what do we do with that? Are you going to pause, postulate like, oh, it happened to have this helicase and then just poof, totally different architecture, which by the way, I have evidence of that. Um, maybe I'm really getting ahead of myself, but uh, let me see. I had this on peaceful science. Uh, just unpeaceful blog in the world. Unpeaceful science. <laughs> uh, oh, maybe I have it here. Hang on. I have it on one of my Reddit things. Helicase. Uh, if I don't find this quickly, I'm just going to move on. But all right, what I had found, let me see if I could find this one more time. I'm going to try one more time. Uh, no. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. There is a helicase. Uh, I, the helicase, it's either bacteria and eukaryotes or, bac or eukaryotes and archaea. I don't know. I don't remember which. One of the helicases that is shared between uh, eukaryotes and archaea reads in one direction and it's opposite in the other, like in bacteria. I may have had this reverse. That's why I wish I had the, um, I, I wish I had the link to this. But what that means is it, it's implemented differently. In fact, for it to do that, it has, it also has all these other accessory things. It's just different architectures. Like how did that happen? Um, not to mention the helicases are moving in, you know, five prime versus three prime uh, mm -hmm. across uh, a, a different organisms. How did it just decide to switch? You know, uh, we can uh, just so say that I, I, I feel really bad. Uh, apologies to the uh, viewers. I totally botched that. But going back then to this whole thing that there's nothing that's conserved across all species, even prokaryotes. Um, yeah, common, common ancestry is pretty much useless now. I mean, what's the point of assuming it? Mm. Except for like metaphysical indoctrination and keeping um, evolutionary biologists employed. Because if they say it's irrelevant to biology, that's the last thing they want to hear. Yep. So anyway, let's just uh, go on. And we're getting finally close to the end of the article. But the pan genome might become more relevant as scientists gain greater understanding. Uh, just speaking of relevancy, I'll say no, it's not going to be more relevant. <laughs> but the pan genome might become more relevant as scientists gain a greater understanding of the diversity and behaviors among those early cells and in the environments they inhabited. That's part of why Ledger thinks it's worth considering whether LECA might have had a big diverse pan genome. Key aspects of metabolism, such as the ability to process sugars, 
could have been distributed in the population rather than in, in every cell. And that might have allowed the organism to colonize more environments than other microbes. If so, that could help explain why eukaryotes diversified so quickly, Ledger says. A diverse Lika population spread across many different environments could have led to many semi-isolated subpopulations prone to interbreeding. That's a scenario that fosters diversification as seen when species colonize islands today. Nevertheless, others are skeptical that the pangenome of Lekka would have been that big. The pangenomes of eukaryotes today are small in comparison with those of prokaryotes, which makes some scientists doubt that Lekka's pangenome was uh, any larger than, say, ours. I would agree that species have pangenomes, and Lekka was a species, and Lekka had a pangenome, Doolittle said, but I don't see any reason to suppose that Lekka was a species any different than any other species that are on the tree. Uh, it just happens to be the deepest node. Uh, I don't completely understand that. I, I don't um, I, I can, I can go, go ahead. Put that down for you. Sal, can you bring it back up so I can actually read it? Make sure, 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 sure. Thanks. Uh, I just need to have it on screen. All right, so basically what, what um, Doolittle's comment here is getting at, um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, me still being sick. Um, so what, what, what Doolittle is getting at here, he, he's agreeing that Lekka was not a single cell. It was a, it was a population of cells. It was a single species rather than a single cell. So he's agreeing with that. He's agreeing that, um, it was, it had a pan genome. So in other words, each individual had less genes than the whole species did. Um, but then his argument is that, well, why should we think that the last universal eukaryote common ancestor um, was different than the species we observe today? They've all got pangenomes, but they all aren't, you know, they basically he's saying, that, yes, it had a pangenome, but the pangenome wasn't huge, like some of these other people are saying it was. That That's his argument here. Um, and, and yes, it was a species, but no, it, the, the species didn't have this monstrous pangenome. So he, I think he would argue that a lot of these genes were more de novo rather than um, being originating in the uh, in the Leka. So, and and that's I mean, if I were evolutionary guy, that's what I would think too. You'd have so, to because if you start arguing for a massive pan genome, you lose. Right now, so the other side of that is how difficult is it to make de novo genes if, that are non-trivial? <laughs> and I will I've often said this. Creationists don't say it's astronomically improbable to make um, a new gene or a new protein. You can make trivial ones. It's not too bad because it's going to do something if you just have a new sequence. Um, it may not, but anything that is like, say, part of the protein complex where they're binding sites and ha you have to have precise geometry, like say a helicase or topoisomerase, uh, that's another deal. That's the sort of stuff that is not easy to evolve de novo. And uh, I think we're going to learn more uh, um, about how difficult it is to uh, evolve certain classes of de novo proteins. So that's why I've, if you've seen some of my talks, I tried to emphasize the multimeric ones, the ones that have quaternary structure mm -hmm. where, where pieces have to fit together. I said, that's not so easy. <laughs> To, uh, to evolve that. And um, an isolated enzyme that's just monomeric, um, yeah, um, we, we can tweak here and there, but uh, something like ATP synthase, topoisomerase, helicase, and then these, these other gigantic complexes, they don't even bother calling it a multimeric because it's just, just gigantic, just like forget it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then especially the ones that... Uh, where the pieces assemble and then disassemble and then the pieces go to another complex. Just like, yeah, forget it. This is just going to be ridiculous. If we find more of those, uh, that's going to be a serious problem for de novo emergence. Um, yeah. when, when it has basically maybe the same function, but a, a fold that's different enough in an architecture that's different, just different enough that it's going to make the, the de novo emergence kind of like questionable. Yeah. And it already is. I, I studied the zinc finger proteins and they look similar enough that an evolutionary biologist will say, no problem. But then I say, well, 
you don't know, you would have to co-evolve its binding partners. This isn't as trivial as you think, bud. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and so and I could go on for something like an hour on how you actually can't really get, you can't get de novo genes in the sense that they want you to get them. Um, you can get, you can get, I gotta be careful how I phrase this. You, you can get novel function, but it always represents genetic breakdown. Yeah. Um, so you, you can you can get novel function, you can get novel proteomes out of it, but you're all it's always a representation of a, of a loss of original function. Yeah, and 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 I'm gonna if I have another show, I'll cover this with the zinc finger proteins. They said, oh, it, it's it's so easy to evolve it, just uh, do random mutation. I said, well, then what happens to the binding partners because zinc fingers bind to DNA. And, and so the evolutionary biologist said, that's proof that the DNA co-evolved with the protein. I'm just like, yeah, I sooner believe in Noah's flood. You guys are just, you guys have just gone off the deep end. You don't even see it. So, uh, sorry. You know, I can get on my soapbox all day when I just yeah, see this. I've only just, been at this article for something like two hours. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this article i went there is no way we're finishing this thing in an hour <laughs> okay so the basis of all evolutionary reasoning despite uh, let me just uh, let me just make sure okay we are recording we uh, i just wanted to make sure i did unpause this because otherwise we would have lost some juicy stuff the basis of all evolutionary reasoning despite the debate surrounding the extent of Le- leca's pangenome Many of O'Malley's, O'Malley and Ledger's colleagues do agree that it makes sense to think of LECA as a population of cells. But there has been some pushback to that idea too. According to O'Malley, some scientists insist that LECA had to be a single cell, one that split, then split again and again and again, eventually giving rise to all other eukaryotic cells. There's something to me very curious about this deep attraction to the genealogical view, she says. To her, viewing LECA as a population is the only way to truly understand how it arose and how it led to the diversity of eukaryotes alive today. Quote, populations are the basis of all evolutionary reasoning, she said. By definition, evolution and natural selection act at the population level. It's not a matter of cells. It's always a matter of populations. That's why she and her colleagues push that a bit harder, she said, to emphasize that they need to think about populations when reconstructing the history of eukaryotes, because this affects, this affects how you reason about the environment, how you reason about genes. It's especially important to attempt to reconstruct LECA, because ultimately the organism that existed then likely wasn't just comprised of the traits seen in eukaryotes or their closest living relatives today. Quote, I'm not sure if one can understand evolution if you only look at what gets retained, she said. We have to understand the population stage to understand why certain things got lost along the way. The trouble is we may never know what LECA looked like because no fossils or remnants of DNA will ever reveal its nature directly. Even the best genomic methods can't literally turn back time and allow us to watch how sequence, a sequence changed. It's basically impossible to concretely determine what LECA's genome or pangenome looked like. But that doesn't mean it's not worth pondering. LECA is where we all come from, the raw material from which the diversity of eukaryotes arose, arose as Wickstead point put, put it. And just because we can't see a way to rigorously test competing hypotheses now doesn't mean we won't be able to in the future. I think it's quite, I think it's obviously quite important to understand what was back then and what kind of biology was going on in order to try to understand how the lineages evolved from that point, he said. Simply asking these kinds of questions reveals gaps in our understanding of the eukaryotes alive today in Ledger's view. There's so much that we still have to learn about microbial eukaryotes in general and just how they behave, uh, what's normal for them, she said. And that's the end of the article. 
Yeah, sorry, folks. We didn't get to the peer review article today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we only went for two hours on this one. <laughs> well, um, um, Emery, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, sure, I, sure. This was a great. Um, this was a great session, by the way. Yeah, no, this was this was fantastic. Um, first of all, um, I think that this article reveals that the evolution there's a, there's a major shift, a quiet one, but a major shift going on in the evolutionary community in their way of thinking about um, the e eukaryotic ancestor. Um, now, it's clear from the diversity of opinions quoted in the article, there is diversity of opinion in the field. But it's most of the people seem to be at least open to a population approach. Uh, the only one guy, I think, at the beginning of the article who was quoted who wasn't at least open to a population approach. Now, if you start going to a population approach for the last universal um, eukaryotic common ancestor, it's a gradual step toward a cr creationist position. It's not a great step, but it is a step. I don't expect them to make great steps. Um, but basically, and I, I think that at some point, they'll probably have to get to a point where they say, well, maybe this was multiple species that were evolving into this. I, I'm surprised somebody in this article didn't throw it out there as a possibility. Um, but I, I suspect as they, as they sequence more eukaryotic um, uh, organisms and as they uh, dig into it a little bit more, they, they're going to start finding out that um, that pan genome that they're so worried about being huge is going to keep getting bigger. Um, and as it keeps getting bigger, they're going to have to sit there and go, what do we even do with this? And they're going to, somebody somewhere is going to go, well, what if there were a couple of most recent common ancestors for eukaryotes? Uh, and then they're going to start this fight all over again. And that'll probably be about mm, 20 years. <laughs> um, but because they, they move kind of slow. But uh, that's where I suspect that they'll probably end up. Um, and that's probably about as far as they'll go toward a biblical model. Because if they, they go much further than that, they'll have, to, they'll have to abandon evolution. So they won't do it. But um, I think they're, they're getting close to about as biblical as they're going to get. Um, just because if they, if they go beyond like, single-celled ancestry they might they're going to start having to think about uh, created organisms and multicellular created organisms and they don't want to do that so uh, but yeah it was a very interesting article and this article is surprisingly is one of the is one of the better uh pop sci articles that i've i've read um it, it's for one thing it quotes excess rather excessively from science the scientists it, it clearly and it got a it got um opinions from a bunch of different people um so the Kudos to the writer. She did good. I think it was a woman. She did a good job um, putting together a, a very interesting article, and uh, she obviously did her homework on it. So uh, well, well done. Well done. Yeah. Christy, yes. Christy yes. Christy, the author is Christy Wilcox. I forgot to mention yeah. her as the author earlier. So, uh, so uh, yeah. Kudos and, to, to Christy Wilcox. She did a uh, she did a good job writing this, um, and they they clearly did their homework on this. Um, and I learned some stuff. I know Sal was. Uh, had had a few mind blowing moments as he was reading through it, so uh, I'll let him tell you about those. But I thought it was a good article, very interesting. I had a lot of fun in this session. Me too. And I'm going to try to just um, I'm going to try one more time to find that thing on helicases. Uh, if not, I'll save it for another. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, to do justice to this. I'm going to have to um, save it for another show. I just feel bad, and apologies to the readers. I feel bad passing on uh, what I know is probably uh, faulty information. So whatever I said about the five prime, three prime reading, um, there's a story to be told. I, I just need to get the details correct. It is a problem for universal common ancestry. Uh, that, that was not me. It was something that Change Tan pointed out. So I'm going to close the show now, but let me uh, just give some passing remarks. This is one of my, this is a proverb. Let me share a proverb here. Uh, let's see if I, I think it's Proverbs 14.4. Yeah, there it is. One of my favorite verses, in, uh, my past, one of my favorite pastors, his favorite verse in the Old Testament. One of them is, um, where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Uh, so what does this have to do with anything we did today? What God is saying, sometimes you got to deal with the doo-doo if, if, if you want to move forward. 
uh, much increase comes by the strength of the ox. What we did today, you know, some people really just want a quick, oh, you know, just prove God to me today and just uh, let's settle it. What we did today is really dig through some stuff mm -hmm. and, and suffer through it um, with the hope that we're starting to build a foundation for understanding why there's intelligent design in biology and, and, and why the doctrine of universal common ancestry is going to have major problems. We touched on it, but it can't be done, you know, with cheap, simplistic arguments. Uh, this, is, this is what I feel it'll take to prosecute the argument well. We, we go through these peer-reviewed papers methodically and build a strong base, just like a student of science would. And you'll, your faith will be built up because these arguments are not shallow. The, um, they're very well, they're well reasoned and methodically um, studied. And when, when we consider all the details, it's like, how, how can you believe that um, this just happened uh, without any intelligent design? That, that's, my, that's my view. So I would like to thank all the, all the, uh, all of our viewers. I especially want to thank Emery who, uh, despite his illness, stuck with me for over two and a half hours. And uh, I, I hope we'll uh, do this again soon, Emery. Right, and I'll, I'll meet just, hey, just shoot me an email when you want to talk, Sal. All <laughs> right. So um, I'll meet you backstage in a minute. God bless to everyone. Bye-bye.